Well, good afternoon. It is a Friday afternoon, a very late Friday afternoon, and I hope my topic will be scary enough to uh, keep you awake. <laughs> we are in the midst, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that we are in the midst of a cultural crisis in many respects. One example of this is physician-assisted suicide. Will we go the way of divine mercy or mercy killing? Physician-assisted suicide goes by many euphemisms, such as medical aid in dying, that's the most recent one that you'll see out there, or death with dignity, but there's nothing dignified about suicide. And there's certainly nothing dignified about a physician killing his patient. The famous ancient Greek physician Hippocrates understood this. And his oath changed the course of medicine for two and a half millennia. But in less than a century, Hippocratic medicine has begun to topple. Hippocrates also lived in a deaf culture, like ours, when he penned the Hippocratic Oath 2,500 years ago. The oath states in part, I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asks for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. In my medical practice for the past 34 years, I have been privileged to take care of, take care of endangered species on either end of life spectrum. My youngest patients, are in utero, and I have been blessed to care for several patients who have reached the age of 100. Both ends of the age spectrum are now in jeopardy, along with the disabled and marginalized members of society. The Hippocratic Oath's reference to abortion is reminiscent of another insidious death movement, which ended in the legal and moral disaster of Roe v. Wade in 1973. This was a major blow to topple 2,500 years of Hippocratic medicine. However, on a positive note, whereas abortion on demand in a few states quickly culminated in legalized physician, in, in, in legalization it has been more than 20 years since the first state, Oregon, <coughs> legalized physician-assisted suicide in 1997. Physician-assisted suicide is now legalized in six states and the District of Columbia, but it has been rejected multiple times when it has been presented in other states, including several times in the state of Massachusetts. And please, God, we will continue to defeat this as it comes up year after year after year. We have already defeated it seven times, but they're going to keep coming back. And as you can see on this map, the red states are the states that have legalized assisted suicide. Oregon in 1997, followed by Washington State in 2008, and then in Vermont in 2013. In 2016, California and Colorado fell, and then the District of Columbia in 2017. And just within the last few months, uh, Hawaii legalized assisted suicide. But as you can see in the green, 10 states since 1997 have put laws on the books fighting back and making physician-assisted suicide illegal. It's a far different trajectory than Roe versus Wade. And the blue states are all the states that still have 
laws on the books prior to 1997 which make physician-assisted suicide illegal. The uh, state of Montana is a special case where physician-assisted suicide for all practical purposes are legalized via a court case where they made a decision not to prosecute physicians who uh, participate in assisted suicide. And there are just two states that haven't taken a stand, and that is Nevada and Wyoming. It is no coincidence that the two prohibitions against killing at the beginning of life and at the end of life are linked in the Hippocratic Oath. There have always been temptations regarding medical killing. Yet, despite having a puny medical armamentarium, when compared to today, Hippocrates nevertheless rejected killing because he understood what we as a culture increasingly do not understand, that a physician cannot be both healer and killer and maintain the trust of his patient. So what is physician-assisted suicide? And I personally like the term doctor-prescribed suicide because this is more descriptive of what the doctor is actually doing. He's writing a prescription for about 100 sleeping pills giving it to the patient, the patient takes it home, he may, by, he may be by himself, he may be with family. In most cases, there is no medical supervision and the patient takes this medicine, often with great distress, with vomiting, aspiration, sometimes seizures ensue. Sometimes a patient isn't even killed, but wakes up a few days later wondering what the heck happened. So this is what's happening, they make it sound you know, they talk about a quiet and peaceful death. Well, in many cases, it's far from it. Physician-assisted suicide is another descriptive term. It's a little bit more, pass uh, more passive for my taste. But in any event, physician-assisted suicide or doctor-prescribed suicide occurs when a physician helps a person take his or her own life by writing a prescription for lethal medication which allows the patient to commit suicide. Euthanasia, on the other hand, occurs when a, another person does an action with the intention of ending the life of a suffering patient. I like the definition of C. Everett Koop, who's a pediatric pro-life uh, physician who served as a Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan. And he said, I have always defined euthanasia as death by someone's choice, someone who considers the life in question not worth living. Now considering any life not worth living is a very dangerous c consideration for many reasons. I now want to, del to delineate many of the dangers, dangerous to you, dangerous to me, dangerous to society in general. And I will do this from a purely secular point of view. We cannot be accused of trying to force our religion on somebody else. These are purely secular arguments of why physician-assisted suicide is dangerous. First of all, it's dangerous because doctors make mistakes. The laws that are out there say that a person must have a terminal diagnosis and have a prognosis of only six months. Many of you will recognize this person as, as Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist who died recently. He was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, when he was 21 years old. And he was given three years to live. Well, he just died recently at the age of 76. He lived 55 years. This is a huge mistake in prognosis. And where would we be without the uh, brilliance of Stephen Hawking? When I attended a hearing in uh, Massachusetts on Beacon Hill about three years ago now, there was a 
a person who testified who said that he had been diagnosed with ALS, same as Stephen Hawking, about two or three decades prior. And it turned out that they were wrong. And he was still alive. And this, again, was a huge mistake in diagnosis. So doctors make mistakes, both in terms of diagnosis and prognosis. Another danger for physician-assisted suicide is that it is a recipe for elder abuse. I hear statements like this all the time. I feel like giving up. I'm tired of living. Doc, don't get old. I don't want to be a burden. Now, d depending on the mindset of the physician and the legal environment, statements like this from elderly patients, from any patient, can be taken down two very different pathways. Either a pathway of encouragement and support, or down a pathway of despair and death. Now, this isn't my patient. This is Kate Cheney, and she was one of the early victims of physician-assisted suicide in Oregon. She was 85 years old. She was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and she also had a mild dementia. Her daughter, Erica, took her mother to the primary care physician and asked for assisted suicide, was coaching her mother to ask for assisted suicide. Well, the primary care doctor knew her. She knew she wouldn't want this. Plus, she knew that she was uh, demented and didn't really understand what was going on. So he said no. Undeterred, Erica took her mother to see a psychiatrist asking for assisted suicide. And the psychiatrist refused and put in his note, you know, for the same reason that she wasn't really understanding what this was all about. And he wrote in his notes that the daughter, Erica, seemed uh, somewhat coercive. Well, still, Erica was undeterred. And he took, uh, she took uh, her mother to an ethicist at, the, uh, at her HMO, which is kind of an oxymoron, and asked, they're, they're in the business of trying to uh, save money. And so um, when he, when uh, she approached the uh, this ethicist at the HMO, uh, she agreed that she could have, that she was a candidate for assisted suicide, and within a few weeks, she had taken an overdose and was dead. This was in Oregon. So, physician-assisted suicide puts a price tag on life and cash-strapped governments and profit-minded insurance companies have already steered people towards suicide in order to save money. Assisted suicide laws typically stipulate that two witnesses are required to request suicide pills. But one of these witnesses can be an heir, like Erica, perhaps. The conflict of interest is obvious when a witness stands to gain by the patient's death. Expensive treatments often require prior authorization, which can be delayed or denied. And it is in the payer's financial interest to delay or to deny payment for care. This is more than just a headache for physicians or and more than an inconvenience for patients. It is downright dangerous. So PA can lead to PAS, that is the prior authorization, can lead to physician-assisted suicide. And once legalized, and this is very important, once legalized, physician-assisted suicide becomes a medical procedure and a cheap 
medical procedure, which payers will and have taken advantage of to steer vulnerable people towards suicide. This is not just theoretical. This is uh, Barbara Wagner of Oregon. She was a 64-year-old woman who had lung cancer and it had been in remission. And then she learned that the cancer had re returned and would likely kill her. Her last hope was a very expensive drug that her doctor prescribed for her. The Oregon Health Insurance Plan, basically Medicaid of Oregon, refused to pay, but sent a letter to her saying that they would cover her suicide pills for about 50 bucks. Insurance companies and government see dying as a cost-saving measure, steering those with limited finances toward death. This is Randy Stroop, also of Oregon. He was a 53-year-old man with uh, metastatic prostate cancer. He too, like Barbara Wagner, got a letter from Medicaid of Oregon stating that his prostate cancer was too advanced to warrant expensive treatment, but the state was willing to pay for his assisted suicide. And it's not just somewhat older individuals who are getting, like, getting letters like this. This is Stephanie Packer of California in October of 2016. A 33-year-old wife and mother of four with scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disease which scars various organs of the body, including the lung. You can probably see that she's, she's on the left and she's wearing uh, some oxygen. At age 29, she was told she had three years to live. And her physician prescribed a different chemotherapeutic uh, agent. Medical insurance refused to pay, but was told that drugs to put her to death were covered for a co-payment of a dollar and 20 cents. Another danger of physician-assisted suicide besides the slippery slope regarding steering the vulnerable towards suicide is the slippery slope toward active euthanasia, voluntary or involuntary euthanasia. I want to tell you a story about an elderly couple patients of mine in their, in their 90s. This is not them, but it's a cute couple. <laughs> and John and Martha is not their name, but I'll call them John and Martha. John was involved in the Normandy invasion, and he survived the Normandy invasion. And after the war, he worked in a steel mill, and he met Martha. And they had two children, two sons. Tragically, the older son, many decades ago, killed himself while he was a, a college student. And then, many years later, just a few years ago, their only other son committed suicide in his 60s after the death of his own wife. Shortly after that, Martha had to be admitted to the ICU, an atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response, something that's fairly easily treated, but if untreated, will lead to death. So she went into the ICU, and she was very distraught, very depressed, and refused all treatment. And the ICU physician saw this woman who was about 93 at the time and said, well, she's old and she doesn't want any intervention, so I'm going to put her on a morphine drip. And so uh, when I learned that she had been admitted to the ICU, I, I went to her uh, to see her. And I walked in the room. And this is, this is the, the importance and the beauty of having a relationship with a patient. As soon as I walked into the room, she took one look at me and she said, Dr. Rolo, are you mad at me? 
And I said, of course I'm not mad at you, but I know you, you don't want to do this. And she said, yeah, I know. And within just a, a few seconds, she decided that she would accept treatment. She was put on the appropriate medication for atrial fibrillation. She got better, she went home, and she's still at home now. They're, John and Martha are both about 95. And when she left the hospital, John came up to me and said, thank you for giving me my Martha back. Now I told this story, I went to um, a meeting with some legislators on Beacon Hill and spoke to the chairman of the Joint Commission of Public Health and I told this story, and just to go on, uh, at that time, the House bill before the floor, uh, b before the, um, the Joint Commission of Public Health was House Bill 1991. And under that bill, had it passed, Martha could have not just withdrawn care, but she could have requested a lethal drug. And this particular bill was, was even worse than most of them. Uh, most of the bills that are out there say that a, a request for suicide pills have to be made twice, two weeks apart. With this particular bill, there was no waiting period. So a second opinion could have been gotten on the same day, and it's easy to get a second opinion. You just ask somebody who, who shares your uh, values. A psychiatric consult was not mandatory, but had it been mandatory, it is not mandatory to treat a person with obvious depression. The only thing that's required by, by these laws, by these bills, is that the uh, patient in question, despite being depressed, understands what he or she is asking for. Now this bill would have also put uh, pressure on a dissenting doctor if the doctor decided he didn't want to participate in this. The law tells the doctor that he has to transfer this patient at his own expense to somebody who will give the assisted suicide uh, pills. So the existence of physician-assisted suicide would put pressure on the vulnerable not to be a burden. So again, getting back to this meeting I had with this uh, legislator, I was telling them this story, and she was indignant. She said, that would never happen. Well, in fact, it's, it's already happened. This is a story about Clarietta Day, and Clarietta Day was also of Oregon, and this is her story. After passage of the Oregon law allowing physician-assisted suicide, but before it actually went into effect, this is back in 1997, Clarietta Day, age 78, had a severe stroke. She had told her long-standing uh, physician, Dr. James Gallant, that she did not want heroic measures and did not want to be kept alive on machines. Based on this understanding of the patient's wishes, Dr. Gallant, first of all, took her off of life support. Well, so far this is okay if she was moribund and she said that she didn't want to be on any kind of life support. But then he went further than that. He gave her frequent large doses of painkillers. And when that didn't kill her, he attempted to stop her cardiac pacemaker by placing a magnet over the pacemaker. But despite that, she continued to breathe. And then he ordered an intravenous injection of a paralyzing drug, and Mrs. Day died in 15 minutes. But something like that would never happen. Well, Dr. Gallant wrote on the death certificate that the cause of death was not him killing her was not euthanasia, but was stroke due to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this all happened, mind you, before the law even went into effect. It had just been passed, but hadn't been put into effect. So the Oregon Board of Medical Examiners investigated and called this active euthanasia, which it was, an action that they felt was both unethical and illegal. And what, did they, what punishment did he get? They suspended his license to practice medicine for 60 days, and then he was able to go back and practice medicine. The district attorney, the, the district attorney decided not to file criminal charges. Another example of this slippery slope is the Dutch 
experience. In only 23 years since the mid-70s, Dutch doctors had gone from being permitted to kill the terminally ill who asked for it, to killing the chronically ill who asked for it, to killing newborn babies in their cribs because they had birth defects, even though by definition they can't ask for it. Dutch doctors also engage in involuntary euthanasia without significant legal consequence, even though such activity is officially prohibited. They just look the other way. So writes Wesley J. Smith, an opponent of physician-assisted suicide, in his book, Forced Exit, The Slippery Slope from Assisted Suicide to Legalized Murder. There is an additional danger that the right to die becomes a duty to die. This is Brittany Maynard. You may remember her on the cover of uh, People magazine some years ago in 2014. She was a 29-year-old woman with brain cancer. She had a, a grade four glioblastoma. She decided to travel Oregon because it was not legal yet in California. She, she traveled to uh, Oregon, and this was sensationalized by the supporters of assisted suicide and put on the cover of People magazine, was trying to tug at the heart strings of the uh, nation, saying that, gee, somebody like this should be allowed to ha have her own choice. And she died on November 1st, 2014. So many of you may have heard about her. I'll bet you... No one in this room heard about Maggie Carner. Maggie Carner lived in Connecticut, and she had a brain tumor like Brittany Maynard. And she said, Brittany's suicide puts other patients like me at risk, risk of abuse or subtle pressure to comply with state-sanctioned suicide. Another danger is that physician-assisted suicide will lead to medical breakthroughs being stunted. An example of this is another woman who had brain cancer, was on the cover of Time magazine, Marianne Anselmo, the lady on the left. She also had a brain tumor, but she chose to fight it, and at age 59, she, she went to um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City and she was treated with an experimental drug and her tumor, her brain tumor, had not grown in a year. And, by, and more than a year later, uh, there was no evidence of the cancer being present. I'm not sure where this case stands now, but if, if people turn to suicide, there is the pressure taken off of the medical establishment to look for cures for these kind of, um, of uh, deadly diseases. Another person with a brain tumor was J.J. Hansen. He was given four months to live. In 2014, he had the same diagnosis of Brittany Maynard and Maggie Carner. He had a glioblastoma. He was treated with an, a, an experimental drug again at Memorial Kettering, Sloan Kettering uh, Hospital, and his tumor went into remission uh, two years from the diagnosis. Hansen, however, does not see assisted suicide as a choice that affects only the individual making it. He said that its influence on others should keep it illegal. Having the option to die will dishearten severely ill patients, especially those who feel they are a burden to their families when they most need to rally their courage. J.J. Hansen testified on Beacon Hill, the last go around of, of one of these assisted suicide bills, and he courageously did so because he uh, died just a few months later. Uh, while he was alive, at the end of his life, he was the president of the pa Patients' Rights Action Fund, which is the nation's leading organization protecting the rights of patients and people with disabilities by opposing 
assisted suicide legalization efforts. So he was given four months to live, but he lived four years. And how precious are those four years to him, to his wife, to his child? Another danger, laws that advantage the white, wealthy, and well-insured should not be made at the expense of the poor, people of color, the dispossessed, and the disabled. It is the white, if you look at the demographics, you look at the studies, it is the white, wealthy, and well-insured who want the additional choice of assisted suicide, because they can pay for their treatment. But they want that additional choice to get a bottle of suicide pills from their doctor. But it is the poor and the people of color, minorities, disabled, they are the ones who may not have the resources, and they are the ones who, once this is legalized, are going to be steered towards suicide. It's already happened. In 2012, there was a ballot initiative in Massachusetts. It was question two. And question two, if people were to vote yes, would allow physician-assisted suicide. Now, if you, anyone familiar with Massachusetts could look at this map and see that, well, first of all, the, the green shaded areas voted yes for physician-assisted suicide. The pink areas voted no. And it's no coincidence that it is the poor parts of the state that voted no because they realized that they would be the victims. So you look at the, the suburbs of Boston, the North Shore, much of the Cape and the islands where the more wealthy people resided, they voted yes because they would get another choice. But the people in Worcester County, you can see right down through the middle of the state, for the, for the most part voted against it because this is a less well-off, more blue-collar uh, area. And if you need a little bit of reinforcement, this is a map of Massachusetts shaded according to the, um, to the uh, uh, per capita income. And you can see that, the, again, the suburbs of Boston, the North Shore, the South Shore, the Cape and the Islands are the wealthier parts of the state. And they are the parts of the state that wanted assisted suicide. And so you can see that if this were to, if this were to have passed, it would, have put, it would have pitted one part of the state against another, the more wealthy part of the state against the poorer part of the state. Another danger that physician-assisted suicide place, uh, is that it places pressure on physicians to violate their conscience. And as I mentioned before, these bills uh, force a doctor to be complicit by transferring the patient, often at their own expense, to somebody who will uh, complete the assisted suicide if they, chose, if they chose not to participate. These uh, assisted suicide bills force doctors to lie on the death certificate. So you see cause of death. The, the assisted suicide laws that are out there forbid the doctor from writing assisted suicide. You have to write the underlying diagnosis where it says cause of death. This is legalized fraud. Now suicide itself is an important public health issue and it is an increasing problem in the United States. And our society is giving very utilitarian mixed messages to people. If you are able-bodied and able to contribute to society, well, you can climb those stairs and get some help in preventing suicide. But if you're disabled and you're kind of a drag on society and you're not very uh, useful to society, well, you can go up this, this ramp and uh, take part in assisted suicide. Since uh, this is the, the general suicide rate among men and women aged 35 to 64, 
since 1999, or, and Oregon uh, legalized assisted suicide in 1997, since that time, the general suicide rate on the left went up by 28%. But in Oregon, the general suicide rate went up almost a double. Here's another graph where the, the green line on the bottom is the general suicide rate. The blue line at the top is the suicide, general suicide rate in Oregon. And the red line in the middle is Washington State rate. And you can see that from 1990 to 1970, the general suicide rate nationally was actually going down. That first vertical bar where that marks when physician-assisted suicide became legal in Oregon, you can see that the trend in the country started to climb, and it started to climb even more in Oregon. And that second vertical line where physician-assisted suicide became legal in Washington State, you can see how the trend was up everywhere. So when people see that certain groups of people can solve their problems by suicide, then they get the idea that, well, hey, I have, a, I have a big problem too, maybe I should kill myself. This shows th that pain management will worsen. If physician-assisted suicide becomes more prevalent, there will be less pressure on trying uh, palliative care and trying to alleviate pain. This is a study in Oregon comparing two times. Time one, the gray bar, is the time period between 1996 and 1997, just before legalization in Oregon. The second bar, the black bar, was after legalization of assisted suicide in Oregon. And pay, uh, family members were asked to describe their, their family member who was dying if they were comfortable. Well, before the law, as you can see on the far left, before the law went into effect, 43% of the family said yes, this, my uh, loved one is being kept comfortable. After the law passed, that number went down. They were asked to rate about mild pain, moderate pain, and severe pain. Mild pain uh, was not too much of a difference, but when asked to rate whether or not their loved one was in moderate pain, the third set of bars from the left, once assisted suicide was passed, the family members judged their loved one as being in more pain for as far as moderate pain is concerned and as far as severe uh, pain, uh, uh, being in severe pain. So you can see that there, is a, there was a trend in this particular study that once you try to kill the patient and not the pain, that pain management actually gets worse. So, for many reasons, physician-assisted suicide is not safe for individuals and not safe for society in general. So to summarize, physician-assisted suicide is not about giving patients the right to commit suicide. It's about giving doctors the right to kill. The main organization that's that's uh, pushing this is Compassion and Choices. They were originally known as the Hemlock Society until they realized that naming your organization after a poison is not good PR. So they call themselves Compassion and Choices, but they are not compassionate. It is not compassionate to kill your patient. And as I've shown you, some people get more of a choice, but many people get no choice at all. Now they, they listed two two uh, reasons for having assisted suicide. To avoid unbearable pain, these proponents of assisted suicide say, we need to have people avoid unbearable pain. But we have the best pain management in history. We have wonderful palliative care. We have wonderful hospice. And when patients are asked about pain, they say that's number six on their list of concerns as far as their terminal illness is concerned. The second argument that they give, it's my choice, my right. Well, patients already have the right to refuse medical treatment, and they may take their own lives, sadly. 
But again, laws to legalize physician-assisted suicide are mainly for the white, well-insured, well-to-do, well-educated patients. Assisted suicide laws are dangerous for patients because there's a loss of trust in doctors, a loss of choice at the end-of-life care, there's the money incentive for premature death, there is coercion by government, insurance, possibly family. There's a lack of appropriate treatment for depression. So-called safeguards don't work because doctors are often wrong about diagnosis and prognosis. And as far as I'm concerned, talking about safeguards regarding something that's intrinsically evil is kind of a joke. It's dangerous uh, for doctors because it gives doctors too much power. Dangerous for families because they don't need to be informed and it can, can create a lot of dissension in a family. It's dangerous for society because marginalized groups are vulnerable. It increases suicide rates. And we don't need anything like this because we have great palliative care and hospice care, especially in this state. And it, assisted suicide removes the hope for medical breakthroughs. Now I'll just uh, skip this. And choice um, is an illusion. If, uh, if passed, patient choice would be reduced. A doctor must discuss feasible alternatives, including palliative care, but options do not mean that the patient can actually access these or that insurance will actually pay for it. So it's fine to be talking about options, but if the insurance company won't pay for it, what kind of option is it? There will be less focus on extending life and eliminating pain and more fo focus on cheap options such as assisted suicide. And there are no precautions for the person once assisted suicide prescription is filled. These pills are taken home, they could be put on a shelf, and someone who would benefit from the patient's death could trick the person or force the person to be taking this medication because there's no supervision required. Second opinion is not a safeguard. The per prescribing doctor can refer to another patient in favor of physician-assisted suicide. I got a, a letter was sent to the Mass Medical Society from uh, Dr. Benz in Oregon saying, don't have this pass in Massachusetts. Listen to what happened to my patient. Uh, Dr. Benz had a patient who had metastatic melanoma and he referred his patient to an oncologist to treat this metastatic melanoma. Well, a few days later, the oncologist called Dr. Benz back and said, will you be the second opinion for a physician-assisted suicide? And Dr. Benz said, well, no, I referred him to you. He's depressed. He just got diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. I referred, to you, I referred him to you to treat him, not kill him. Well, the oncologist simply asked a colleague to um, be the second opinion for assisted suicide and the patient was soon dead. We have defeated in Massachusetts physician assisted suicide seven times, 95, 97, 2009, 2011, 2014, 2016, and just again in 2018. And we defeated the, the ballot initiative in 2012 51 to 49 percent, and this was after being behind by about 30 points just three months before the election. But they're going to keep coming back. We need to keep fight, uh, fighting this. I like what C. Everett Koop said. I went to medical school to learn how to save lives and alleviate suffering. I saw no tension between these points of view because I was a Hippocratic physician. There was an absolute proscription on the taking of life. If I could heal or cure, I would do it. But in doing that or failing that, I would relieve the suffering of my patient. Hippocratic medicine does not require that the act of dying ever be prolonged. If my patient has received all that I can do for him, and if healing is not possible, I can alleviate his suffering and still stay well within the bounds of do no harm. And he concluded by saying, the ancient doctor of those days could cure practically nothing, and yet it is self-evident that he did what he could within the framework of do no harm. And finally, 
I am a Catholic physician, and this is largely a Catholic audience. I have just given you many small c Catholic, that is universal reasons to reject physician-assisted suicide. And these are the arguments that we must use in a secular society. And I implore all of you to use these arguments unceasingly in the public square, especially with your legislatures. legislators. Go home, call your representative, call your state senator, tell them you're happy that these bills are going down to defeat and you want them to continue to go down to defeat. And when they come up, as they will, year after year, we need to be on the phone to legislators to drive that message home. Ultimately, however, we as Christians must reject physician-assisted suicide because we are made in the image and likeness of God, and God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son so that we might not perish but have eternal life. We are not the authors of our own existence. Simply put, if you didn't make it, you can't break it. We have no right to reject the gift of life or to assist another to reject that give, gift, especially those final precious moments of life when we have a chance to reconcile, to say goodbye, to forgive, and be forgiven. Thank you.